tweet at Today SOR. You're very welcome back to the programme. Now, over the past few days, there has been more reflections and commentary in social media about the Paris attacks, which left 129 people dead. Well, our reporter, Elaine Devlin, has been looking back over a week of sorrow and pain in France. As details of those who died in last Friday's attacks came to light, a Twitter account, On Memoir, was set up to remember those who had died. One tweet with a photo for every victim. Eric Tom, 39, France. Designer, photographer, husband. Dad of one, soon to be two. A big heart. Elsa Veronique Delpas, 35, Chile. A beautiful person, full of life. Mom to a five-year-old son. Then, as dawn broke on Wednesday morning, hashtag Saint Denis started to trend on Twitter. Armed police had surrounded an apartment in Rue Corbillon and an intense gun battle followed. Later that day, Eagles of Death Metal, the band who were playing at the Bataclan Theatre, posted their first message on Facebook since the attack. Comments flowed in from those who had survived. I came from London for the gig and was shot twice. I was there with nine friends and by a miracle we all got out, though half of us were injured. Peace to the band. You were as much victims as we all were. And yesterday, dramatic CCTV footage was released, showing a woman cowering outside one of the cafes last Friday. A gunman approaches. He fires, but the gun seems to jam. He casually walks away. She runs for her life. Antoine Larisse lost his wife, Helen, in the Bataclan Theatre in Paris. He wrote on his Facebook page during the week. His post has been shared thousands of times. On Friday, you stole away the life of an exceptional being, the love of my life, the mother of my son. But you will not have my hatred. I do not know who you are, and I do not want to know. You are dead souls. Well, just some of the voices uh, from the week of sorrow and of pain in France. Our, our reporter Elaine Devlin put that together. And now for a review of the week's news that was, of course, dominated by events in France. I'm joined here in studio by uh, Monsieur Jean-Pierre Thébault, the French ambassador to Ireland. I'm also joined by Sheikh Dr. Mohamed Umar al Kadri, the imam of the Al Mustafa Mosque in Blanchardstown, by Michael Clifford, who's special correspondent with the Irish Examiner, and by Regina Doherty, Finnegal TD for Meath East. You're all very Welcome and thank you all very much indeed for coming into us uh, this morning. Uh, Monsieur Thebo, I'll go to you first of all. I mean, obviously looking back on th- what happened this day last week th- in, in Paris, but this morning we're seeing this unfolding attack in Mali. Again, it would seem an attack on French interests. Can I ask you your reaction to what you've seen this morning? <coughs> you know, um, it, it's not an attack on French interests. It's an attack on Mali. Uh, it happens that there are some French citizens but fundamentally it is another terrorist attack. And I think that uh, we should also remember there was this attack in Beirut. So the question is, France was attacked massively because France is a symbol. But we remember that uh, over 15 nationalities you know, were casualties in Paris. So fundamentally it remembers us that the question of terrorism, especially this mass terrorism sponsored by the so-called Islamic State, is now a threat worldwide, is a threat to all, to all of us. So I think that it is now time to tackle it effectively, both at home but also even more importantly, where the origin of the problem do lie and where it is striving, is, you know, trying to grow in Syria, in Iraq. We must remember that daily the people in Syria and Iraq are victims, direct victims of mass murder, executions, 
you remember probably those photographs of of young children, you know, used mm. to enlist to 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 fire at at point blank on prisoners to execute them. It is stories of mass graves that are found, you know, on a regular basis of of elderly women and men. Everybody was different from them. From their philosophy, is executed or forced to flee. This is the problem we have to tackle together. And Ambassador, can I ask you? I mean, is there any? I mean, you're you're so right. This is it's a global problem of mass terrorism. There are victims right across the world. In fact, the, the primary victims, you'd have to say, are, are are in Syria at this point in time. But is there a feeling within France at the moment that France has become the focus? <coughs> for Islamic terrorists in Europe at this point in time, from what we've seen of the the cells between Brussels and Paris? Currently, the the biggest attack was carried on France. But remember, the claim of the so-called Islamic State was targeting France and Germany. And by the way, there were several football matches who apparently escaped, Mm. at least in one case, a very serious attack. So the question is, beyond France... Um, it is a, a larger problem that we need to tackle, that we need to tackle together. From this point of view, the fact that the uh, Justice Council and Home Affairs Council today in Brussels will adopt, we hope, a strong set of measures is important. It is a first internal reaction, but it is not the end of the way. The problem we have to tackle is a, is a you know, long-term problem which needs a long-term effort. And the sooner we tackle it effectively, the better and the sooner also our population will be again enjoying their freedoms. Because also, we all remember what is at stake is the way we look at daily life, the way we look at values, the way we look at freedom. Those people are enemies of our freedoms. And Ambassador, we've seen the the shorter term reactions, if you like. We've seen an escalation of French airstrikes in Syria. What do you identify as the longer term solutions to this? A settlement in Syria in Iraq and Syria, a settlement which can help definitively eradicate the power base of the Islamic State in a way that restore not only the possibility of a daily life in Syria and Iraq, but also ensures long-term prospects for its population. Do you see that happening? Do you believe that the international will is there to do that at the moment? I mean, I suppose we've seen some movements from the US and from Russia in recent times. We hope that in testimony of the souls of those innocent victims, um, this will be a wake-up call, a strong wake-up call, and we are working in this direction with all the countries which are of the same mind. We are very encouraged by the strong reaction of uh, the European states. We are very encouraged also of the talks which are currently going on with all the interested parties. We have asked for a UN Security Council meeting. We want this to be a global response, a unanimous response. We must not only do it because it is our duty, we must also do it in order to honour the memories of all the victims in Paris, in Beirut, eventually now in, in, in Bamako. And to bring you in, um, Sheikh Omar al Qadri, I mean, you have spoken out in the past, in fact, on this programme about your own fears around the radicalisation of young Muslims living here in Ireland. And it would seem from the attacks last week in Paris that these were European Muslims um, who had been <coughs> radicalised and who had visited Syria. What do you take out of it? I think um, when we look at the problem of uh, problem of radicalization, there are many factors that contribute to radicalization. We've got the social, economical, and political factor, but also the factor that is related to religious interpretation and misinterpretation. In fact, these people, from the reports that we have of these terrorists, they were not religious people. They were people that even did not know how to read the Quran, but they were still motivated by many factors, and among them is religion. So they were clearly uh, being educated about religion, but not not the right interpretation. Their understanding of of Islam was clearly a distorted and a wrong and evil understanding of Islam that the majority of the Muslims do not adhere to. And the problem of radicalization is this, that we, we as Muslims have been primarily primarily the target of radicalization and extremism. Most of the attacks uh, happen in Muslim-majority countries. Um, and, and now the attack has happened in France. 
And I think it's a wake up call for the world, as His Excellency Mr. Ambassador has just mentioned, that we must have a global response. And in order to have an effective global response, we must um, include all the stakeholders and we must bring them all on table. And among them are, of course, the religious leaders, the politicians, the policymakers to come together to have an effective long term um, uh, approach and policy to eliminate extremism, bombing with airstrikes. Uh, merely without addressing the theological, ideological and social political aspects will only increase these radicals and will, will effectively uh, give a space or to, to more recruit uh, people. And, uh, and, so would you disagree with that approach, the approach we're seeing at the moment of the escalation I think, of airstrikes? I think merely, merely airstrikes without a ground offensive. Uh, I think it, it will not help on a long term basis. It will only increase radicals. It will only increase support in Syria and Iraq uh, among people because w- with airstrikes, you can never um, eliminate, eliminate the chances and possibilities of innocent people dying at the same time. Mick Clifford, if I can bring you in on it. I mean, that is a a debate that is well underway in France, Ambassador, as you well know, as to whether or not this is the right approach to to come heavy handed in the initial days. What would your own views be on it? Well, I think I'd have to agree largely with what the Sheikh said there, because um, like from my reckoning, the only place where bombing has succeeded seems to be Kosovo which was a very localised issue and one that could be dealt with there. Unfortunately, when you have a scenario whereby young people who grow up in cities like Brussels and Paris and London or whatever have the potential to be radicalised merely on the basis of the religion they were born into, there has to be an awful lot of other things at issue. And what feeds a lot of that is a sense of injustice towards Sunni Muslims. Whether that sense is justified or not isn't the issue, but there's potential there for that feeling to be exploited, and that seems to be what is happening. And unless that is addressed, um, bombing alone is not going to solve anything. Ambassador, you wanted to come back in on that there. Um, In fact, I fully concur with what is being said. You know, this must be addressed on all its dimensions. And uh, what I understand the Shea said is that just bombing is not enough. We need to tackle definitely the issue on the ground. The question of the radicalization is multifaceted. That's obvious. Nobody ignores this. And from this point of view, I think it's a very clear sign also in France that today the prayer a Friday prayer, so important, you know, has been elaborated by all the representative of the Muslim faith to send a very clear message, which is also a message of commitment of the Muslim community that it doesn't recognize terrorism, it fully, you know, refuses terrorism and makes it clearly unacceptable for religious grounds. So yes, it's a set of measures whereby the communities themselves have a very important role to play because silence sometimes can be misinterpreted. Absolutely. But also where the global community has a role to play, but where also the links with the internal and international situation must be addressed. Because this attacks in Paris, you know, they were committed by people who came from different places in Europe. Belgium, Mm. unfortunately, Mm -hmm. France also, and we have to acknowledge that. But the masterminds came from Syria. The orders came from there. So there will always, unfortunately, be weak people, weak minds, dead souls, deadly souls also, who might be tempted. So if we don't repress the source, and once again, not only because we we think bombs could, could be a policy, also because the first victims are also the people in Syria and in Iraq. Yeah. They are mass murdered by those people and they are not only at random mass murdering them, they are mass murdering them in order to establish a state they call a caliphate, once again to try to have a religious dimension, but it's, 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 they know nothing about the real caliphate. Mm. The exactly. fact that at that time the state, caliphate state was a very elaborate here. society, okay. very inclusive which was society. very inclusive, was full of freedoms about science and culture, They are, in the name of a so-called caliphate, which they ignore completely, trying to establish a totalitarian state. And this is the real problem. If we let it happen, if we let them, you know, structure and, and, and in the long run, then we will have a much bigger problem. So the reason for which I say we agree, we need to work on all the aspects. 
OK, let me, Regina Doherty, if I can go to you on this. I mean, listening to the ambassador there, the primary victims of this do live in, in Syria and neighbouring countries. But what we have seen as a reaction from Europe now is a, a beginning of a questioning as to whether or not we should continue to accept Syrian refugees. We've seen what's been happening in, the Ameri- in America in the last few days on this issue. We're talking about closing Schengen borders or tightening Schengen border controls. Do you think that it is a just approach to this um, issue when we've had hundreds of thousands of refugees come from that that area and it seems there's the potential that one passport was involved in this. Um, Well, first of all, I suppose, can I just say that given the events last Friday and the unfolding um, stories and testimonies of not just French people but obviously closer to home Irish people who were there um, it certainly has brought the situation in the Middle East home to everybody's house um, because I think sometimes before and it was seen as a, a in, in general practical day terms it was seen as a, a, an issue that didn't really affect us it was miles and miles and miles away and it was nothing to do with us in you know in, in sunny little Ireland but the events last week um, of pure terror and evil uh, and the loss of such wonderful lives as described by the lovely um, response of Anne Memoir um, just goes to show the impact of genuinely something so far away as having on all European citizens. And I think we need to get our head around that because I'm not sure as a collective body um, we have. Um, And as for jumping to the conclusion that we should close our borders or tighten controls uh, from uh, an accepting of refugees perspective, I think that would be music to the ears of the terrorists because that's exactly what we should not do. And what we should do is to recognise, um, as is excellently has said, that the, the main um, victims and the most vulnerable people in this situation are the people who are living in Syria and in Iraq and in Lebanon and in all of those countries that are suffering at the hands directly and daily, not randomly or sporadically, but directly and daily at the hands uh, of the terrorists that are using um, their Muslim religion uh, in the most thwarted and unethical and evil way um, to just progress their own uh, agenda. But Regina, the fact is that it does appear that uh, Abdul Hamid Abaoud, at the very least, used the refugee route to return from Syria back to Paris. I mean, do you just say, listen, let's be nice to refugees or or do you need... No, no, we don't. So what we certainly do, and you look at the passing of the new uh, Criminal Justice Amendment Bill this week, uh, and you'll have further, there's an EU security meeting um, today or maybe yesterday it happened. You need to look at particularly now, sharing of intelligence information in a more specialised way that probably hasn't happened um, in in the past. We need to acknowledge and um, admit that, OK, probably not the intelligence information that's going to come from Ireland is going to have any real impact, but we need to admit and acknowledge that there needs to be a sincere sharing of information from the Americans, from the Germans, uh, and maybe even further afield. And for that so to that be effective, do you also need to reintroduce firmer border controls so that people are picked up as they cross? borders and are entered on security systems. Well, we should have that anyway. And I mean, I think if you look at the processes that are going to be established um, months ago when um, the young boys image that's, you know, sprayed across the world brought us all to feel emotionally the about the refugee. on the Turkish beach. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there was a, a, an immediate outcry that we should just open the borders and let people in. I don't agree with that. We should certainly facilitate um, the movement of people away from uh, I- areas of major conflict until obviously that conflict can be resolved, but in a meaningful way that they are obviously, you know, vetted and registered and that they come through proper controls and then we have obviously the facility. And there is some way of picking yeah, up. And we look I mean, after there them. is the other issue. I mean, it's estimated that that around 30 young men have gone from Ireland to potentially Syria, as I understand, Dr. Shekhamar, you have highlighted this. But Regina, just to, to finally, I mean, have we any way of being aware of when these 30 young men return or in any way making sure that they are not engaged in terrorist activities when they do return? Well, I mean, we would have our own security um, committee and I would have to assume that they are aware of the people that potentially could cause uh, a threat to Ireland. You've read the statement that they released this week, um, uh, rising from their meeting on Saturday, that there is always the possibility, but it's highly unlikely in Ireland. But we have to be aware. And if we're not aware, then we certainly must make ourselves aware of any potential threats. Uh, But I think more importantly, we have to show the solidarity in our actions um, to our neighbouring countries, uh, of France, of Germany, of the entire European Union, joining together now in a very meaningful way. And what uh, do you mean by that, solidarity of our actions? I think... 
Simon Coveney mentioned this week that you know that we would be ready maybe to um, involve ourselves. That we has done it in, in instances in the past to uh, Send assist trips to Mali was one thing that was put on. Well, to to assist in peacekeeping um, operations, and I think that's something that obviously we would be ready and willing to do. Um, but actually, more importantly, I think just to be sharing of our information um, and for us to be all aware uh, and for the EU to be having a an EU wide plan to address this issue for us to wake up to this very large, uh, awful, evil wake-up call, but for us to work together and to work in unison. Okay, and just on Mali, we're seeing now that military officials have confirmed at this point that three have been killed there uh, following the uh, hostage-taking, but it seems to be a a situation that is still underway there. Ambassador, to come to you on that issue of um, returning French nationals, French nationals who have travelled out to Syria and have, it would appear, been radicalised, like Abdel Hamid Abdoud, Some voices in France have been calling for internment for these returning French citizens. What would your views on that be? Or is this something the French government is looking at? There is a whole set of measures that the government is considering. But the first thing, and it is happening right now, because today the the European Justice and Home Affairs Council is meeting at the highest level, is, is to strengthen the European system. We are a member of a community. You know, one country cannot ignore what the other country plea is, but neither can it ignore its needs. From this point of view, you know, there is a saying, a chain is as strong as its weakest uh, you link. Know, link. From this point of view, there should be no weak link in the European chain of solidarity. That's the first point. And this decision will be very important and they are they are absolutely needed and we know that Ireland will be on the side of taking the necessary measures as all the European countries. So that's the first point. The second point, yes, we are considering specific measures in France. And uh, you, you can fully understand that I cannot, if I were I am informed, you know, tell more about the details, the very details of this. But among those measures, obviously, there is a question of the returning jihadists. Bearing in mind that it is a European-wide problem, all countries are affected. No countries can say that it has known, unfortunately. And when you say something about this, about this Mr. Abu Daoud, um, you know, he's a Belgian citizen, he came back, you know, to Belgium, and the fact that we couldn't efficiently locate him is raising the issue on being more efficient on the external border of the EU. And the external border, what about the internal borders? Do you think it's time to raise this is a passports su- but this for is a subject borders? For the first, according to Schengen rules itself, you know, you can always decide for specific period or specific events to as we say, close the border, meaning impl- not close, but implement stricter control. And it has been done in many instances, like when there were large, for example, sport uh, events taking place in, in a country, always a stricter control. Now, prob- it's probably needed to look again on how we do this, but how we do this not only on an isolated base, but also on a solidar- uh, you know, on a solidar base, you know, together. And this is exactly what is at stake in, in, in Brussels. But definitely... We need now to provide to the security forces the necessary instruments within the law in order to achieve what is their mandate. They can only protect us if we provide them with the necessary necessary instruments. But beyond it, the question of the security of the citizen is also the question of for each citizen. We are all involved. It mm. is our common values, our common way of life that is at threat, mm. that was attacked. We are all responsible of making it, you know, able to be defended. Mick, to to bring you in on this, I mean, the debate has already started in France of this balancing of liberty versus security. At this point, the police in France are operating under emergency powers. They can raid houses. I mean, is that something that would concern you, this this extension to three months of this emergency period (coughs) and the idea of notions around internment, for example? Well, I, 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 I can't speak for what's going on in France, Gillen, but I mean, notions around internment, I think, would concern anybody if it came to that. But 
It's an ongoing issue, like, I mean, the whole issue of balancing civil liberties against security, and it would seem on the basis of how some of these individuals managed to go and detect it, that there was some deficiency, not necessarily in the French security uh, agencies, but somewhere in terms of general European security, there was deficiencies in not being able to uh, pinpoint them. But again, we uh, like everything, and I'm sure people are taking care of it, it is that balance, and... When you, we know in this country, as well as anyone from our history, when you go beyond that balance, um, the, the, there is certain backlashes that are going to be felt. And, and the problem here, and the, the most frightening thing I saw during the week was a headline that I'd have to agree with to a large extent. It said, Islamic State, as it's called, and I don't even like calling it, has a plan and that plan is working. Mm. So far, what we've seen in the wake of last Friday... And I uh, totally accept it takes time to respond in, in a more coordinated way. But so far, it seems that their plan is still working. And, and that is the depressing thing. That's the worrying thing at the moment. Although, I mean, there have been some military advances. I mean, oh, Sinjar oh, was quite a significant but event look, last the, week. The, and, and the response and the way they caught um, <coughs> this man during the week. Yeah. That there was some huge... And also, we know that a number of attacks have been filed by various European countries. There have been successes. But their overall strategy... Yeah, it's and we're looking at Mali unfold on the television. But Mick, just to, you have written extensively on, on the Gardaí here in Ireland. From what you know, would we be prepared? Would we be able for any type of assault here in Ireland? I don't think I'd be in a... I, I don't think I'd be... I, I No, to be honest with you, Keen, like, could we say that? Would, would anybody be aware... We, we had some of the army personnel during the week saying... They weren't equipped. Um, it's very difficult to know. And how, how, how do you rate that threat and how much resources do you put to it and how do you uh, approach it through legislation? Um, it's very difficult to know, I think. Sheikh Mohammed uh, Umar al Qadri, there is a, another side to this. I mean, you've spoken earlier on, you said, you know, that this is not being done in the name of, of the Muslim religion. But the fact is that it, it is. It's, it's Alu Akbar is what we're hearing when the gunmen arrive in. How difficult is this making it for the Muslim community? I mean, here in Ireland, obviously, but also in France, we've already seen some <coughs> attacks on individual Muslims in the streets there. Absolutely. We've seen attacks in not only in France, but also in Canada, in the UK and in Australia. Um, I think, um, first of all, I agree that uh, when we say it's not uh, you know, a problem of Islam, what we what try, what we'd say, or we'd, what, we, what we mean by saying that it's not in the name of Islam is that this is not the Islam that we believe in. This is not the Islam uh, that we propagate and adhere to. The Islam that we believe in is an Islam that believes in pluralism, that believe in, believes in peace. Um, these people are clearly using religious text out of context. They are distorting this text and the teachings of Islam. So from uh, fr- from a Muslim community perspective, we have to uh, eliminate the possibility of misinterpretation of the text. And that is exactly what has happened. We have the uh, one of the most prestigious seat of learning in the Islamic world, the Al-Azhar University. They have uh, issued fatwas. We have a very prominent Muslim scholar uh, that, is, that is based in Canada, Sheikh Dr. Tahir al-Qadri. We have many other scholars like Sheikh al-Yaqubi that have issued fatwas. But I think what is needed is that uh, Muslim communities in Europe particularly, they must ensure that the curriculum taught in the mosques, in the madrasas, the weekend Islamic schools to the children um, does include uh, chapters on uh, on peace, does include chapters on engagement with the other, engagement with the non-Muslims, and particularly also highlight and tell people which verses do these extremists use out of context and what is the right and correct interpretation, understanding of these verses of the Quran. And Ambassador, the teachings in Muslim schools, it's something that is being examined in France at the moment, isn't it, as well, in terms of the languages used even? Absolutely, it is something, and it is probably also one of the, of the, of the, 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 the um, you know, very positive evolutions. Now it is this engagement of the Muslim community, whatever are its divisions. There always have been divisions linked to historical reasons, but they have, uh, they are now coming together to say. Yes, we need to take our responsibility. It's not only a question of the state. We need to say and testify from within the community that it is not us. It is not our teaching. It never will be our understanding. This is very important. Just one second to be back on the question of freedoms. You know, I don't think that France is is, is considered as being a country that want to to repress freedoms. Uh, the emergency powers and the state of emergency first are limited in time. Twelve days. It will be passed 
by the parliament, you know, for three months and, and look at, and look, you know, at, at the result. The reason for which we had to have those, those emergency powers was in order, for example, to attack this commander, which was hiding at 4.30 in the night. Mm. According to normal rules, the police forces can't act before 6.30. You know, except if they see so the judge, etc. So you know, it's, it's very practical, yeah. and and I think everybody, every citizen, would understand. Okay, uh, Regina, I'm very sorry. We, we, we've run out of time here. I, I didn't get to, to, to come back to you, but thank you all very much indeed for joining us the, this morning. It's Regina Doherty, Ambassador Jean-Pierre Thebo, Sheikh Omar Al-Khadri and Michael Clay.